All right, welcome everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Kara Circle. Kara Circle is a nonprofit programming arm of Kara's Books. Kara's Books is located in Decatur, Georgia, uh, which is a suburb of Atlanta. We are um, usually uh, physically in the space of Kara's Books, but of course, because of COVID-19, we are coming to you um, remotely. And um, it's my great honor to be here celebrating a really important book, The Unapologetic Guide to Black Mental Health. Um, we're here with the author, um, Dr. Rita Walker, who um, is on the far right of my screen, and I believe is on the far right of your screen. But if you hover, there you go. Um, that is Dr. Rita Walker. And um, we are also here uh, with Dr. M. Denise Lovett. And um, we are going, Dr. Denise Lovett is the founder of Huduma Services. So I'm going to be putting Huduma Services in the chat so you can learn more about that work. That is a psychoeducational consulting firm um, for young people who need guidance about post-secondary education. Um, and Dr. Rita Walker's uh, website, I'm also going to be putting in the chat so that you can learn more about their work as we're talking. We know how important this event is, this book is. Um, someone has already asked, Arlene asked, when will you get more shipments of the book in? So I want to tell y'all right off the bat, we actually do have copies of the book. All you got to do is email us. Unfortunately, because of the supply chain and the way that the um, website is set up, uh, it says that we are out of stock, but all you got to do is email us or give us a call and we will sh ship a book out to you straight away. So we have them. We knew that this was going to be popular. So we hoarded our copies ahead of time. Um, and it's a happy problem for Dr. Walker that the book is already selling out. So let's be proud of her and happy for her that the book is selling out. And don't worry, because we got copies for you. So um, throughout this chat um, and this conversation, there is a ask a question button at the bottom center of your screen. We're going to encourage you as questions come up, as you think of things, to just go ahead and put your question in there. Um, and Dr. Lovett will be, you know, assimilating those questions into the conversation. If you have any problems or if you need anything, um, you can direct that to me in the sidebar chat. Just say, hey, ER, if you have a question, I'll, I'll be paying attention to that. Um, and uh, if you have anything else, you know, you can speak to one another. You can say where you're viewing from. We want this to be just a fun and friendly conversation in the sidebar. So um, without further ado, I'm going to get out of the way and, uh, and invite Dr. Lovett to, um, to kick it off with Dr. Walker. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Dr. Walker, it is good to see you again after all these years. <laughs> I know it's good to see you. I don't even know how long it's how long it's been. Yeah, I think probably early 2000s or something like that at the Association of Black Psychologists Conference, if I remember correctly. But uh, I was really pleased to see that you had written this book. Your book is one of the few books about black mental health that's actually written by someone who is a practitioner in black mental health. And so I really appreciated seeing this book. And one of the questions I have for you is what inspired you to write your book? Yeah, well, before I, I answer that, I do certainly want to thank Karis for hosting this event. Thank you so much, ER, for, for the introduction, everyone who's already joined in and, and is excited about being here this evening. You know, I, I wrote, this book has been a long time coming. Let me just say that. It's probably been coming since the first day I stepped foot in an undergraduate psychology course and didn't feel like I was represented or my community, the black community was represented in an undergraduate textbook. And I got my degree and said, you know what? I'm gonna go to grad school because I'm gonna change things. Well, you know, some odd years later, things haven't changed a whole lot because I do think that it's important, and you know, it's important for, for our reality, like our real reality, the reality that some people are just kind of learning about in the last couple of weeks, for that to be represented in how we manage our psychological well being. And in ways that we don't even realize, you know, we're just kind of like tiptoeing around trying to exist in ways that other people are flourishing. And so, so for that reason, the book has been on, on my heart probably for a while now. But what I've started to notice, uh, the statistics started about 2016, uh, where we saw more suicide crisis for, for children, for African-American children. And I'm not a child psychologist. I, I wanna say that up front. My emphasis tends to be more so in working with adults. But for me, 
in order for children to be okay, adults have to be okay. And so I wrote the book because I see what I think is a lot of undiagnosed depression, anxiety, folks just walking around with luggage full of depression and anxiety and not realizing it and needing to manage it so that our, our children could have functioning, healthy lives. So it's been brewing, but some crises started to emerge. And I said, you know what? It's time for me to speak up. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Let me see if we can get a question from some audience members here. Okay, so we don't have one yet, I don't believe. Okay, so I'll go to the second question. You introduce us to the concept of psychological fortitude. What is it and what's its role in terms of our mental health? Yeah, I can tell that with your questions, there's so much background that I, that I wanna just kind of <laughs> set the foundation because I realize okay. one of the reasons that we don't, I think that we're not aware of the level of psychological distress in the community is because there's this fight to just keep moving. You know, no matter what you're doing, just keep moving. And that is, that is tiring. Um, and so one, so that's one part. The other part is the second somebody hears mental, they think crazy. Um, that's got nothing to do with me. I don't have mental issues. I was in a workshop recently and someone said, well, if I'm not having a nervous breakdown, I'm okay. Right. And I'm thinking, is that your threshold for being okay? That's not okay. And so I just wanted to just abandon the word mental health. Y'all ignore the title of the book. I wanted to abandon the word mental health and completely reframe it in a way that people would be more intentional about their well being without using the word mental. So that's how psychological fortitude came up. And I'll use, you know, PF, because psychological fortitude I know is a mouthful. So, but then the PF in my mind is akin to the SFP, SPF. You know, when we think about sunscreen and we have to put sunscreen on to be able to be okay in the sun and it protects us, it protects us. And F SPF ranges, right? So PF defined is a zero to 10 or zero to 100 if you're an overachiever. It's a zero to 10 rating of your ability to be able to work on a job effectively, work in the home for those who are stay at home parents, work at school, you know, some folks who are at work and at school doing everything, um, taking care of children and taking care of one's own health. Like a lot of folks have chronic health problems and don't even realize that if you've got depression on board and there's a 50% chance that you do, if you have chronic illness and you're depressed, it's gonna be hard to eat like you're supposed to and exercise and do all the things that you have to do to take care of yourself. But it's our responsibility, right? Um, and, and live the life that we were put on this planet to live. Like I truly believe that everyone has a role to play in our society and we have to be able to identify it. Some people can't because of overwhelming anxiety. For black folks though, we have to do all those things well while also managing the threats to our very lives. And we have a recent example, you know, as folks know, gentleman in the park, bird watching, enjoying his life and being threatened. Um, and then the most egregious recent event of Mr. Um, Arbery jogging for his health and well-being, and he didn't make it home. And so it's it's navigating that balance of being who you need to be on a day-to-day -day basis while managing the threats, taking care of yourself and living your best life. And so if I say to you, you know, so what's your PF today on a zero to 10? You don't have to tell me about your mental health assessment. You just tell me, you know, hey, I'm about a seven today. Like, yeah, I'm doing okay. I'm falling short in some areas, but you know, I'm doing all right. Um, and you don't have to say even that. You could just say I'm a seven and we keep it moving. So it's the zero to 10 rating generally of how you're, of how you're doing. Okay. okay, I like the way you put that on a scale instead of usually when people ask, well, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine but you don't really know that they're fine or you don't know how fine they are. And then they might not necessarily check in with how fine they are unless you're actually asking them, where would you rate yourself in terms, yeah. of, that zero to one, or in terms of that zero to a hundred? 
And it's almost like a default answer, right? Like, I don't know, how you doing? Fine. And then you just keep it moving and they are not fine. Um, But if you say, how are you doing? And they say, you know what? I'm a four because you don't have to overthink it, right? Like it's Mm -hmm. not like a SAT or MCAT question. It's zero to 10, you know, what what you got. Um, So yeah, so I, I, and it's funny because I've, you know, the more I talk about this and now friends who've read the book, uh, I had a friend last week to, to text me were we texting? We must've been texting. Cause I don't actually like to talk on the phone. So she texts me and she said, uh, you know, how are you doing? And I was like, good. And she said, what's your PF? I'm like, Oh Lord, here we go. <laughs> um, and at that moment it was actually a five. And she was like, okay, sounds like you need to go lay down and get off the phone. And she was, and she was right. And so that's the thing. It's like, one of the things that people have to be most intentional about is our self-assessment, you know, from morning to afternoon, to evening, to watching traumatic videos, to spending time with a loved one, to spending time with a loved one that you think you're supposed to be feeling good about hanging out with, but you're like, yeah, this is about a five and maybe I don't need to spend time with them. Um, That if you can do the assessment, then you can make adjustments. Like you decide, it's not just a number for the sake of having a number. It is a number for the sake of deciding what the thing is you need to do or what the thing is you need to remove in order to get to the 10. I mean, 10, that's, that's cooking with grease. So, you know, some of us might just, we can get to an eight on most days. We're good. Right. I can see that. Okay. So, and so when I started reading the book, you know how, when you're learning to swim, you can start off you could be a swimming instructor who starts off on the shallow end and we're going to, you know, work our way up to the deep end, or you could have a swim instructor who just goes you into the deep end. Okay. So that's how I kind of felt when I started reading the book. I was like, Oh wow. She threw us into the deep end. (laughs) So, so what was your process um, behind deciding to kind of take us in the deep end and then tell us how to swim? You know, it's funny you should ask that. So do you, let's, I want to make sure I'm clear about the deep end. So what do you see as making it a deep end introduction? Okay. okay. So I'm very familiar with the research in terms of um, African-Americans and suicide risk. And so I saw the deep end as being the suicide um, discussion and then taking us back. And so I thought it was really interesting. I, I know that that's your work, like I said before, but I thought it was really interesting that you chose to uh, begin that way. So, okay. Um, so this is my first book, <laughs> let me say that. And in working with the publisher, so what they said to me was, okay, w- you know your community, you know, you know your audience, which is funny because I said, well, we can't put mental health in the book title if, if we, that's, that's what we're doing. But they said, no, we got to put mental health in the title. And so I did have suicide introduced later in the book because I didn't want to, you know, scare folks off. Like that was my thinking. But what they suggested was, well, this is the thing that is the crisis that kind of brought you to say, I got to write this now. And they were right. So I said, okay we'll go with it. And, you know, for folks who maybe haven't read the book yet, I'm looking over to see what comments are over there who haven't read the book, you know, I, I get it, but I try and make it as easy as possible to get through those, those chapters, because my whole point is we have to be able to communicate with people who could be in crisis. Like when somebody gets to a place where they're in crisis, it's really hard to back them up out of it. You know, like, Okay, I can't swim, Denny. I can't swim. Let me just. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah I'm. Yeah, I'm. I'm one of those. I can float a little bit. I just learned okay. to float two years ago. Okay. okay. It's not. It's not about me. Um, and so I, I wanted for folks early on to get that they don't have to be afraid of it, because I think that's what happens. And it's not even just for everyday folks. And I say this, you know, like people who are who are trained mental health professionals are a skittish about suicide. And so I did buy into it because I was kind of like, okay, yeah, let's let's do this. This is what suicide looks like. I define the different levels. I communicate to folks about this is how you can talk to somebody. I promise you can. You can talk to someone even if they're saying they're thinking about killing themselves. You can do it. And I believe that 100%. That's why I do the work. Like I, you know, because when I tell people what I do, they're like, ooh, like, really? 
And I do the work because I know it's preventable. And I've talked to people like friends who have read those chapters and then were encountered, you know, with a situation and they were like, oh my goodness, I'm so glad I read that for the book. I was able to keep my head on straight. I felt like I knew what to say. You know, I was able to manage the situation. Whereas if I hadn't read that, I would have completely freaked out. So y'all just get past those couple chapters. I think it's what, two and three, three and four. Yeah, I think so. But I, but I really appreciate it too that you really put yourself into the shoes of the reader in terms of saying, okay, if you're still, if you've gotten to this point in the book, then you know you're with me, and so we can move further. And so I yes. appreciated that part definitely. Yes. And so you talk a little bit about the um, the ABCs of support around those who might be considering suicide. And so can you tell us a little bit about what those are? Yeah, so the ABCs are, if I can frame them as an as a capacity to be present, right? So um, when we think about people who may be in crisis, they oftentimes feel disconnected. They feel like their life doesn't matter. Um, and they feel like, yeah, no one would care if they weren't here. And what underlies a lot of the crisis is really a need for connection. And so ABCs are, the A starts with assume you can help. Like so many people just panic and freak out and they're like, I can't do anything about this. I got to find someone else or I got to call the police, you know, which is scary for us. Uh, you know, I got to put this in someone else's hands. And so I say A is assume that you can be helpful. Just start there because a lot of people tell themselves right off like, yeah, I can't handle this. B is be a good listener. And I don't, I, you know, I think we need to teach listening skills like in school through K through 12. And then again, you know, beef people's listening skills up because I think a lot of people listen to give advice. They don't listen for the purpose of hearing. And when someone feels heard, one of the things that you do is just, you repeat what they say. You say, you know, it sounds like you're saying this and you are fully present in hearing what they're saying and, and waiting because some people really just want you to listen. If they say they want advice, you know, you can say, check in, say, you know, so it sounds like you are asking me for some advice and then you give the advice. You don't just jump in because C is cancel your judgments. Um, so often we're waiting, instead of listening, we're waiting to give an answer because we've already decided how to fix the thing, which is always fascinating to me, because one, you haven't been invited to fix the thing. Um, and two, what if your solution doesn't fix what's going on? And so you have to listen to then also suspend whatever judgments you have. Just cancel all of what your pre-notions were that existed so that you can then respond in a way that matches or meets the situation. ABC. Mm -hmm. And that's a good way of keeping things simple too. And that's something that I think people get easy, easily remember. So, yeah. Okay. I tried, you know, that was my, one thing the publisher said, cause I, I've been an academic for a while and I'm comfortable with my academic voice and I switch, you know, I'm all kinds of bicultural. Um, and so they said, well, you know, you got to talk like you're talking to a friend. And I said, are you sure? Because the way I talk to my friends is not how I talk it work. It doesn't really work out that way. Um, and they said, no, like we we really just want you to do that. And so that that freed me up in so many ways because I get that people, like I have these kinds of conversations all the time. You have these kinds of conversations all the, all the time, but the average everyday person is like walking around with an empty toolkit. And so I needed to be able to write in such a way that folks could say like, oh, I can see how that tool would work and put it in their toolkit. Even if they don't need to use it at that moment, they know that it's there. And, it, and it's really unfortunate, I think, for a lot of our community, because we think like, oh, mental is for somebody else, like struggle and pain is for us, but well-being is for somebody else. Yeah. Um, you know, that if we can just get some tools or at least know where the tools are when we need them, that that, I think it really does take a burden off. At least that's my hope. You know, folks can let me know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, one thing that I thought about when I saw you said something about low key suicide, I thought about, do you watch Insecure? I saw the first season and a half and then I had okay. to take a time out. Okay. Okay. So this whole season 
basically involves everything. Everything begins with low key, like low key done or low key over it or something along those lines. And so when I saw low key suicide, then I thought about your discussion around that particular concept. What do you mean by low key suicide? Yeah, low key, on the low, it's not obvious, mm -hmm. it's disguised. Um, and low key, I don't know where I, you know, we talk about low key stuff all the time. Um, and for me, I have been trying to get the larger professional discipline, meaning suicidologists, and there is an association, American Association of Suicidology. And I have been talking to folks in leadership, I've actually given up by now, um, but expanding the definition of what suicide is. So the formal definition relates to an intentional death. So, you know, so using various methods, but the intent was to die. Unfortunately, we don't always know what the intent was for someone who has passed on. But when we use that definition, we, we miss a lot of behaviors that still have spurred someone's premature death. So as an example, you know, if someone does have type two diabetes and, you know, they're 40 years old, African-Americans are diagnosed with type two diabetes at younger ages than are other racial ethnic groups. So you've got type two diabetes, you have untreated depression, uh, but the doctor has said, you need to exercise, you have to manage your diet, you have to you know, manage your A1C regularly, you have to do all these things or you will die early. And then the person doesn't do it. What, what is that? What is that? You know, I, I know, and you, I'm sure you know plenty of folks who have serious health conditions for the doc, the doctor has said do X, Y, Z, but they send in so-and-so to pick up a whopper in the drive-thru. Right. Like really? Yeah. Um, and how many pieces of sweet potato pie are you going to have? Like right. what, like, what is that? And it is so normalized in our community that people just say, oh, well, that's just what they do. And I just really like for us to be able to reframe it as problematic behavior. Now, remember, we've still got C. We've still canceled our judgments. You know, we're not going to judge the person. Um, I just want to make sure my laptop doesn't go out. <laughs> um, you know, we still don't judge the person, but we still need, I think, to think about their behavior differently rather than just saying like, oh, OK, they'll be fine or I'm going to let them do whatever. Like seriously, you know, if there is something that can be done, you know, to listen, like maybe they are depressed. You can't do anything about what they're eating because, you know, we can't impose ourselves on people, but maybe you can be available to just like talk sometimes like, hey, how are you doing? What's your PF today? You know, we right. can start to think about the bigger picture differently. And I, I hope people are inspired to do that. Yeah, I, I could definitely, definitely see that type of conversation. Uh, one thing that I found interesting was when you talked about how some people, you know, might be on this, you know, low key suicide kit and they'll say things to you like, you know, well, God is in control of, you know, when you're when you die and whatnot. And I'm thinking to myself, well, why are you spinning up your time? But I'm not going to say this out loud. Right. But especially to, you know, some of our elders who decide that, well, I've been this well in my life. You know, you leave me alone, that type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why I try and put some script in the book for all of that. You know, mm -hmm. you say you express your concern and you don't have to have the back and forth because that's tiring back and forth. Yeah lower your PF, right? Mm -hmm. So you just say what you need to say, say your piece. You know, I'm, I'm just, I know that the doctor has said such and such. It concerns me that you fill in a blank and then you walk away. Mm -hmm. Just walk away. You don't have to judge. You don't have to argue in a court of law. Even if you do have a law degree, you just right. walk away. Right. Right. I can definitely see that. Okay, I'm going to see if we have any audience questions. Okay, wow. And this is related to a question that, um, I think that's one of the questions that I thought about as well. But the question from someone is, how do we decompress when we are on guard dealing with racial terror 24 seven once we leave our homes? You're on guard. Racial terror. I'm making notes because that question mm -hmm. has layers. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So 
there, there's two parts to it. There's the, you're on guard because you're anticipating being terrorized. And I don't know where all that is. I actually took a picture of a police officer pulling over somebody in my neighborhood this morning. Actually, there wow. was two. And then I text everybody and say, hey, y'all look out. Right. Um, and so there are things that are in our control and there are things that are, that are out of our control. I do think that that's important to be aware of. And there's even, you know, like serenity prayers about all that. Um, the things that are out of our control are racism, right? We can't, we can't necessarily control racism. A lot of the hypervigilance though, comes from anticipating racism, sadly. And that's why I talk about racism in the book to the degree that I do, because I don't think we even realize how much it impacts us. But it sounds like this person who asked the question in fact does. So right. I think starting with a self-assessment, like, so when you're at home, are you at an eight, but then you leave home and you're at a four? Is it at the job or is it because there's a speed trap somewhere between your house and the job? Mm -hmm. If it's the job, then it may really be worth, to the degree that it's a it's an option, finding another place to be or deciding how you're going to exist in that space. And I'll use myself as an example. Um, and I talk about this in the book, being an associate professor at the time when I was writing the chapter and there are levels to university um, faculty. And so I was an associate professor and the next level was full professor. I was fighting really hard to make full professor so much that it was impacting my health. But because of structural racism and the way structural racism looks in academia is my work is always invested in, in African-Americans and black community for the most part. But I have to get grant money, right? And the money, as you might guess, that's not necessarily going towards what I'm doing, but I'm fighting to try to get this money because I needed the money to be able to demonstrate that I deserve to be a full professor. At some point I said, I give up, I quit, I won't make full and I am okay with that. And I felt so much better. Like you all can probably feel the relief right now because I am tapped into how much better I felt when I just said, you know what? I was tenured, so tenured meant that I had a job for life. I didn't have to fight to be full professor. I was just doing it because it seems like that was supposed to be, that's what I was supposed to be doing. And so when I relieved myself of that burden, yeah, my PF on the regular <laughs> was much higher than when I was fighting to achieve something that was unobtainable. So I think, you know, recognizing what is it about the space that you're in that may be affecting PF um, and then making the adjustments. The adjustments may be uncomfortable, but I think people need to try experiments. I didn't know I'd feel so wonderful by saying I give up. Y'all can have it. But I did. And I had to be willing to do that because it was not worth my health. Um, the other stuff, I think we have to be cautious just about what we're telling ourselves. You know, like I said, when you leave the house, are you telling yourself that the police is going to pull you over? Okay. You might just have to find another route, like seriously, because at the end of the day, what is most important is our psychological well-being. We can't achieve anything else without our mind. Like, well, I can't, I'm not, I can't. No, but we really can't. We really can't. Yeah. Some people think they can though. And I think that's why we just keep like pressing so hard, right? Like mm -hmm. exhausted and fighting. And I'm like, really? How's that working out for you? I'm tired. Right. Okay. Right. Keep doing what you're doing. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're okay. welcome, Kamina. That was Kamina's, I think that yes. was Kamina's question. Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. Cause that was kind of related to, um, to something that I had in terms of suggestions that you have in terms of coping in this moment of, um, televised videos of police or white assaults and murders on black people. What I've told people is stop watching those videos. Stop. What would you suggest? Yeah, turn it off. I have not seen the video um, right. of Brother Floyd. I, I have not seen it. And at this point, my son is conditioned that if he thinks they might show it, he puts his hand over his face. Mm -hmm. um, because the image sometimes just pops up and that kind of infuriates me. So on some of the networks, they will say, you know, this is uncomfortable, but now they just show it. Right. And so, yeah, you got to literally avoid, like you've been doing the TV, you know, limit your social media. Um, I had to turn off the TV those first couple of weeks of uh, coronavirus because I was in a fog back in March and I didn't know why or what was going on, but I had stuff to do. And I was like, literally felt paralyzed. 
And then I realized, oh my goodness, it's the TV. Like I got to turn it off. And so I told myself, because I do experiments on myself all the time. So I told myself, I'm going to turn off the TV by four o'clock. It didn't work. Not the first day. It just didn't work. I, you know, I'm back there at seven o'clock still, you know, repetitively watching this media and this news. And so the next day I said, okay, we're going to not turn it on before noon. And I have been able to sustain that since March. Some days I just don't turn it on at all. And it has been wonderful um, for my first getting out of that fog and two being productive. Though the recent slate of events um, still, you know, kind of set me back a little bit. But again, it's about being mindful and figuring out what we need to adjust to get even a point higher, to get from six to seven, to get from seven to eight, you know, what small thing can we do? Mm -hmm. If you have another question about that, I'll answer it when you're ready, but. Okay, okay. Let's see here. This question is kind of sort of related to like where we are in this space right now. And you quoted James Baldwin who said, to be Negro in this country and to be relatively conscious is to be in a rage almost all of the time. And so I've heard that quote um, several times, not just over the past couple of weeks, but over the past few years. And so how does this show up in terms of the work that you do? Yeah, ooh, rage. Um, I think that, you know, just in order to, survive. And when I say survive, like I literally think that being a black person almost certifies that you probably won't have a PF higher than eight on most days because it's hard to be your authentic self. You know, like Kamina's question, how do you manage the stuff? And especially if you want to, as an example, rise in the ranks in a place where you're one of the few and you have to fit in. Like fitting in takes something out of you. It is exhausting. And you can't be exhausted and have PF of a 10. So I would say, you know, you probably have a a, a rage PF. No, that's not, I'm not gonna do that. But you have a, a, a range of rage, right? Like a lot of us have like a manageable amount of just like anger and frustration. And I think what we see now is that tipping over, like people have just kind of been managing it, like like the, the little frustrations. And I call them little, you know, in fact, we have language for that, you know, racial microaggressions. Right. And I'm like, that's some low key racism. Um, but it's the subtle things that happen that we have to manage on a day-to-day basis, you know, from well-meaning and well-intended people. And that can make it that much more frustrating because then it's like, okay, what was that? And do I need to say something? Um, I got to call so-and-so. So-and-so is not available. I got to struggle on my own. Oh, I'm so frustrated. And then you can't do your job, you know, because you're thinking about this thing. And it is, as you know, aggravating is all get out. And so I think that for people who don't have the level of awareness that maybe they're doing this to me because I'm, I'm black, uh, because of something that I, you know, that is outside of my control, then maybe those folks are okay. Right. Because that's what, you know, that's part of the quote. You, if you're relatively conscious, if you know, this is happening to you because of something that's out of your control, then of course you're furious. You are working your butt off Mm -hmm. and then, but you're being second guessed. Uh, your idea is being snatched up by the white woman. I literally had this happen to me a few weeks ago. I come on a committee meeting. I had an idea. And initially folks was like, oh yeah, that's a great idea, Rita. Like, yeah, we're going to roll with that. And by the end of the meeting, it wasn't my idea anymore. Someone else had hijacked it. And I was like, "This, you got to be kidding me. And so then the next week I was asked to be on another committee. And I said, no, because I am hyper aware of my PF. And I was like, yeah, this just happened. We're not doing, we're not even going to risk being in a situation where we're going to be likely subjected to that again. I'm on a campus where full professors are black women who are full professors are less than 1% of the population. So I am one of the few who gets to stick up for myself and the community um, or just flat out say no, because I can, but it is exhausting. 
So I don't even remember the question, but I hope I answered it. Okay. <laughs> you did. So this this is this is real this particular question is related to talking to other African Americans about or other black people about their mental health. So Courtney asked, how do you start a conversation with someone who approaches mental health as a person the, in the example, you know, as long as I'm not having a breakdown, then I'm okay, right? While recognizing that we have widely different life experiences. Yeah. Well, the short answer is keep living like this. Mm -hmm. You said Courtney asked the question? Yes. Um, yeah, you know, people are where they are. Um, at the same time, and, and so this is how I answered that particular question. Mm -hmm. It was really like, so is that your bar? Like, you want to live your life just like not having a nervous breakdown. Mm -hmm. Tell me more about that. Because I like, you know, I'm like an investigative reporter, you know, like, tell me about that. Like, you just want to not be having a mental breakdown. And the thing about listening, it is you, you would be fascinated what you find out about a person's thinking when you ask a follow-up question. Like we need to, as listeners, just really be curious about a person. I, I promise that if we get to a place of just being curious, it just gets us so much further in understanding a mindset because we jump the gun oftentimes and we think we know what people are trying to say and it's not. And then we're trying to, you know, so I, I didn't get to talk directly to this person because there was a you know similar situation and there was a moderator. And I, I said, you know, well, I just encourage that person to think about, you know, if this is the low bar, if this is the high bar for them, and is this what they really want for their life? And then maybe walk away because people need to sometimes just think about things for themselves. And then when they're ready to come back, you know, and have that conversation, Courtney, you'll be there because you didn't try to beat them over the head with how interesting their thinking was. I like that word. Interesting. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Now we were talking a little bit about like where our minds were in terms of we can't necessarily do much of anything if we don't, I guess, what you might say, we don't necessarily have our minds right, if you will. So you stated that you talked a little bit about the racism piece, which I'm going to get to in a minute. But before we get to that part, you stated that the promise of assimilation is that we can have it all but lose our mind. The promise of assimilation is that we can have it all but lose our mind. What do you mean by that statement? Yes. Well, you know, for me, the mind is about what I said earlier, being able to do your work, be who you are, do your work, you know, achieve work, school, take care of your health, managing threats to so all that mm -hmm. and doing so authentically, like not doing it in a way that's just acceptable to other people. And in this case, we'll just say mainstream white America, the people who are in charge because oftentimes you don't see brown folks in charge. So the people who are in charge, and you know, I can't help but to use the example because it comes up so often where I see as an example, black women who want to you know, wear their natural hair and all the rigmarole that people go through to get their hair to do something that's pretty unnatural. Um, like that's, that, that's, that's not okay. Like we need to be able to be who we simply are. And so when we have to shift our minds in order to say, I can't be me, I gotta be someone else more acceptable. I that's again, PF drop one and a half points, you know, right off the bat. And I get it, you know, I absolutely get it that, you know, we have to present ourselves in non-threatening ways in order to achieve success. Um, but at what cost? Just answer the question, you know, at, at what cost? And I will say, you know, I come back to me because, you know, a lot of the book, you know, I didn't have to inter interview anybody. You know, I was talking about stuff I knew personally. And even with the work that I do and my investment in African-Americans, I know scholars who would say they were advised by their doctoral advisor, you know, back in the day, 
well, you can't do work on culture or minorities or heaven forbid black people. You can't do that because you won't be able to get tenure. You won't be able to get grant money. And for me, I was kind of like, well, that's why I'm here. <laughs> you know, I'm not here to get tenure just for the sake of getting tenure. I'm here because I'm invested in the mental health and well being of my community. So if I'm not doing that work, then I'm not here. But a lot of folks just make that trade off like, well, I want the job. So I got to do what they say I got to do. And it's, you know, in their heart and in their soul, it's just, I think it, it takes something out of them. And then they come and talk to me and say like, hey, so how you get to do what you want to do? And I'm like, because I have a certain level of freedom, you know, I'm trying to get the rest of us free. Right. Mm -hmm. So then what do you say to, uh, okay, so this has been my experience over um, years of teaching students at PWIs and at um, many HBCUs. But I'm getting, I'm getting a number of students and a number of African-Americans, a number of black people who are saying that I've never experienced racism and I don't have internalized racism, it's just preferences. What do you say to black people who say that? Because you do have a chapter in your book that talks about how racism basically contributes to our mental illness for all intents and purposes. I'm basically paraphrasing because I can't remember off the top of my head. But what do you say to, say to black people who say, I've never experienced racism. I don't have internalized racism. I just have preferences. I've had to struggle with myself not to roll my eyes at, <laughs> you know, some people who might say that to me. So what do you say to those people? Yeah, well, you, you roll your eyes and then you smile. Um, <laughs> Because, you know, and, and again, this is, you know, I try, I have my own thoughts. Like if that person is operating at a legitimate nine to 10 on most days, great. Their beliefs are, are their beliefs. Like I'm not, I'm, 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 I'm trying to think of a scenario in which I would try to convince somebody that like, you know, those preferences are problematic. You know, I just look and smile and I'm like, okay, as long as you're happy. If I had to bet money, I'd question their PF, but I'm not gonna do that before they're ready to have the conversation. So yeah, I'm curious. Um, I can't, cause I'm, I'm distracted by this question over here where Claire said her hair is threatening. And so I don't, I don't know Claire if your hair in particular is threatening. Um, I know that my hair on occasion has been problematic in part because people say things when I have straightened my hair, because my hair is not naturally straight, like mm -hmm. flowing in the wind. Um, but when I have straightened my hair, I get feedback like, oh, I like your hair so much better like that. Um, and I have been called, you know, angry and aggressive, which is funny because I enjoy myself, you know, I try to enjoy myself. And so I remember one occasion where someone else overheard uh, white male supervisors talking to another white supervisor about how aggressive I was. And I was like, really? Okay. So, um, and, and to be sure, as much customer service as I can get on the telephone, I do on the telephone. Like if you followed me around, you would see, and I know I see it, there's a marked difference between how I'm treated in person and how I'm treated on the phone when I can do my best assimilated voice. Um, like, yeah. So, so for you, Claire, I'm not exactly sure about your hair, um, but I can tell you for me, and I, I think um, you're about to jump in, Denise. Oh, no, 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 I'm waiting on you. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's, so I don't, so I, so the short answer is I don't know. I was distracted by the question and wanted to, um, oh, so she says, trust me, I'm, I am seen as aggressive, I understand. <laughs> oh, you're being facetious. All right, Claire, we're gonna keep it moving in. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, this is an interesting question. Uh, this is from Vincent. A lot of times people say they're fine because they feel people don't wanna know the truth, especially as a man, some feel emotions are a sign of weakness. What would you comment to that? Wait, okay, I was, I'm sorry, I was waiting for the question. So say Vincent's okay, yeah. comment again. Oh, okay, oh, it sounds like, it sounds more like a comment then, okay. Yeah. A lot of times people say, say they're fine because they feel people don't wanna know the truth, 
And that's, I think that's going back to our earlier conversation about, you know, I'm fine, you know, not necessarily, you know, checking into how fine are you? Yeah. Especially, especially as a man, some feel emotions are a sign of weakness. So how would you um, comment to that particular comment? Yeah. I mean, I think that's absolutely right. You know, people don't want to make themselves vulnerable and they think that other people don't want to really hear what's going on with them. So I think that is 100% true and that we need to start experimenting more. But in my mind, we need a different language. So that's why I said, let's just do a, a PF. And what I didn't finish saying earlier was that in from me, PF is akin to the SPF. You know, some of us can just manage more and deal with more. Like that's just psychologically what we talk about, you know, is, is temperament, temperamental theory. You know, some people, we see them as babies. Some babies are more fussy than others. Um, other babies just laid back and they're just laid back humans for the rest of their lives. And that's our temperament that we're born with. So a baby that's e easily agitated, more fussy, and they grow up to be a slightly more neurotic person, they might have to work harder, do a little bit more to protect themselves psychologically. Somebody who's like, and has always been like a duck with water rolling off their back, they are chill. Like the stuff happening in the environment doesn't rattle them as much. So they don't have to do as much. And so with PF, you can't compare it to somebody else. It just, it is what it is. But just like we have to sometimes reapply, you know, sunblock lotion, I know everybody don't want to wear it, but y'all, that's another conversation. Um, you know, we have to reapply it. You know, if you've been out swimming for a couple hours, I'm sure in the bottle it says reapply after a certain amount of time. And so for me, PF, you know, especially for black folks, it's like the stuff that we used to do maybe when we were 20, 25, eh, you got to make some adjustments when you're 35. You got to get a little bit more rest before you go into the boardroom, you know, and certainly at the point when you're 50 years old, like you've got to adjust. And so PF is about the first the assessment and then the adjustment. That makes sense. That makes sense. You know, one of the most inspiring parts of the book that I found were, well, the whole book is just really excellent. Let me tell you that first off. But when you talked about different ways to reclaim our minds, and so I found that entire discussion really inspirational. So are there some parts of ourselves that need to be reclaimed more than others or should it be reclaimed in a certain order in order to get to another part or would you say that this all happens all at the same time you know i mean i really think it depends on the person um and that's why i try and give like a a lot of different tools so people can try on different things you know some people don't want to change how they think about the world i don't think you can get very far with that but you know and they just want to try something else um, but I think when we, when we consider the larger picture, based on my research and the work that others have done, if you're a person of African descent in the US or wherever black people are in the world, in the diaspora, if you have a disconnect or negative or aversive feeling about what it means to be a person of African descent, that's probably a good place to start to reclaim your mind. And, you know, Asa Hilliard had talked about this in all of his work, you know, and um, Wade Nobles and, you know, to be African or not to be. Mm -hmm. Like the idea that we have internalized this idea of what it means or this notion of what it means to be African. And it's been beat out of many of us. You know, I've heard folks say, like folks who gave me feedback in earlier chapters of the book, like, ooh, I don't know about that Africa stuff. And I'm like, and these are black people. And I'm like, Africa stuff? Um, and I said, okay, okay. I don't know a single community or culture or science fiction character who was disconnected from who they are and was able to achieve their life purpose. I was talking to, I was like, I need an example, y'all. And they were like, well, what about like the Terminator? You know, Linda, um, the, the mother in the Terminator. And she was right. like, no, I can't, you know, raise a son who changes the whole world. And then once she realized who she was, then she was able to kick some, you know, mm -hmm. like you can't be disconnected from your cultural identity and heritage 
and be just out there orphaned and not and, and be successful. And so for those who say, you know, I don't need that. I've never been to Africa. And I've had students to say to me, Dr. Walker, why are we talking about Africa? I've never been to Africa. And I'm like, that's cute. That's real cute. Um, but the reality, and this is what we don't get from our history books. This is when none of us get this from our history books, as you know, that basically African culture was retained. We didn't call it that, but you talk about hundreds of years of chattel slavery and then Jim Crow legal separation we were just together. We didn't show up here as workers, like what they said in some Texas, uh, you, you know, the Texas oh uh, academic books, like some workers, like a worker, what's a worker? Uh, we came as enslaved people who had our own culture. We brought it with us and that's how we survived. And so if we start to disconnect from what has kept us sane in order to assimilate and be acceptable and to just be American, I just don't see that working out. I just don't. But that's my opinion. And that's just the research I've done and that others have done. Mm -hmm. And so would you say that that's part of what might be the cause for, I won't say cause, what might be correlated to the rise in suicide among young people, among young African-Americans, young black people? Yes. Oh, you want me to say more? Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I said earlier that suicide oftentimes is about a disconnection. And the reason that I say that is because a lot of people go through stuff. You know, like a lot of people just have a tough time in life. But the thing that keeps us here is this sense of, you know, spirituality, you know, God is in control of life. And, you know, if I tap into a higher power, I'm going to be okay. And my people have been through a lot. And so I can, I can endure this. It's not fun. It's never been fun, but I can stay here and get to the next day. When you start to lose that connection so much so that like students have been saying, like, I don't know nothing about no Africa. I'm just American. Um, you lose that sense of, of connection to a heritage in which you know that it's not black girl magic. It's just who you are. It's in you. And so when you don't have that as part of your identity, I think it, it certainly increases your vulnerability to the bad things that happen. You know, folks say like, ah, oh, you know, bullying, I got bullied and, you know, bullying. But we had more community. And I think that a lot of us have gotten more disconnected from community and haven't had the wherewithal to try to recreate those communities because we've got to be intentional. That's the word for the day, folks. Intention. In Attention. Somebody type it there in the little box so, so everybody can see it in the back. Yeah, Say it loud. Yeah. Tap it in, right. Type it up in big capital letters. Intention. Absolutely. Thank Absolutely. you. <laughs> Absolutely. I knew I could count on Karis. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so you suggested in your book, okay, so let me tell you, when you got, when you started talking about the church and spirituality and religion, I was like, is she about to make me feel guilty <laughs> or not <laughs> necessarily being a regular church goer? But one thing that you suggested in your book when you had that, that whole um, conversation with us about that was that you suggested that those who identify as atheist or agnostic might not be culturally black. I'm kind of paraphrasing a little bit. Why do you think that might be the case when agnostics believe in a higher power, but atheists do not for you to put those two in the same category. Why do you think that might be the case? Okay. All right. So, and you know, I'm happy to be corrected, but my understanding is that, you know, for persons who are agnostic, there's still, there's like a question mark. Like there's a, there's an uncertainty about the presence of a higher power or entity okay. that is connected to things. And, you know, who I forgot, I think Kamina asked the question, you know, about, you know, racism and, and dealing with stuff. Mm -hmm. Like when you're getting pulled over by the police, you can't have question marks. You know, you have to have a deep rooted sense of higher power that is going to protect you from whatever might happen. So it's, it's really about, you know, I think about those, um, 
oh, I forgot what you call it, but when you're in a doing a group bonding exercise and you got to do that oh, when Nestle you fall back. plunge thing, mm -hmm. you spirituality has to be like that. Like if I fall, something's got me. And from my understanding is for you know folks who are agnostic, there's not that certainty. There's a question mark. You don't have time to flinch. There's no flinching. There is somebody got my back. So that's why I put those together that, and, and this is, you know, spirituality is at the root of African people. It's at the root of what we brought with us that allowed us to be able to survive. And spirituality permeates everything else. And so you've got to know, like, it's not just me. It's not, I could be on my own because if I'm on my own, we don't know how it's going to go down. Okay. So that makes sense then. Okay, so then that, that leads me to another question then having to do with the church once again. So could you discuss, let's see. Oh yeah. Can you discuss that relationship between PF and going to church? And what would you say to those who believe that they have been damaged by the church? Okay. Um Okay, so two parts, the relationship between mm -hmm. PF and the church. That's that's mm -hmm. tricky because I do separate church. So for me, there's church, which is religion, and then there's spirituality. And so for me, church, i.e. religion is kind of like um, what you do, where you go, what time, like those, those kinds of activities that have yeah. structure. And spirituality is like how you live your life based on there being a higher power to which you are connected. Mm -hmm. Okay. I didn't make notes about what the question was. So, okay. No, so no, it's yeah. fine. so yeah. I think spirituality is connected to PF, like having okay. a, a high, you know, a strong sense of spirituality um, facilitates higher PF. So I do believe one of the reasons why we don't, as an example, see, lower PF for black women is this high sense relatively of spirituality. Okay. Like that's kind of keeping things afloat. Mm -hmm. Spirituality obviously and religion are connected, but yeah. it's not one in the same. Like there are a lot of people who are spiritual who don't go to a house of worship or, or, okay. or anything. Okay. Um, okay. Now, what was the second part of the question? The second part was, what would you say to those who believe that they have been damaged um, by the church. And then they say that, well, that's why I don't go. And she's telling me to read, you know, some of the scripture and I'm just not going to read it because that type of thing. What yeah. And see, I do think that reading scripture isn't necessarily connected to going to church because when I hear going to church, I hear people mm -hmm. like there's people in the church and people are messy. Yeah. So for me, if you're if you're reading scripture, you know, there's oftentimes something really very inspiring. And so I actually do include scripture in the book because I'm because part of me is like, well, that's that doesn't even add up. Like you are you are a religious person who reads the Bible and goes to a church. But then your PF is low. Like, did you see the, did you see the scripture in Psalm? Like, what are we doing here, people? And so I would encourage that person to, to find another entry point to their spirituality that maybe, maybe doesn't include a church at all, or maybe just includes a different church. Um, I, I went to a church at one point in life and I was really active. And then because I was really active, I would hang out with more of the people and the people were messy. And I said, oh, okay. When I go to another church, we don't get that active because people are messy. And I need for my spiritual experience to be protected from the people. So, you know, we have to figure out how to get what we need and to be clear about where the problem is. So someone who says like, well, that church over there, they were awful. Well, shoot, when I go to my church, I passed by 511 churches on the way, like just try another place. And if you say, well, I'm just ruling out all churches, then that's something that, you know, that person has probably just decided for themselves mm -hmm. for whatever reason. And I, you know, that's okay with me, mm -hmm. but we have to be honest with ourselves. 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I like how you um, had that breakdown, excuse me, between spirituality and religion in that, you know, people can be messy. People can be messy. People yeah. are messy. Oh, people are messy. It's <laughs> it just it it's level, it's levels to the mess. Levels of mess. People <laughs> are messy. I, unless you, Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa is probably messy too. Okay. Okay. I don't know her. Okay. Um, let me see here. I have someone named Jay who's asking, do you believe that police officers can benefit from training in this area as an overhaul of their procedures and practices? And might it also personally benefit them as a part of their fitness for duty? Um, benefit from training? The short answer is yes. Um, when you say this, that tells me you're talking about this conversation right here that we're having. Um, and so maybe they could be onlookers to this conversation, mm -hmm. but I would question. Okay. So my course, so I oftentimes teach, um, an introduction to African-American psychology. It's not a required course. It's an elective course. I am glad that it's not a required course because when there are people in a space who don't want to be there, it's toxic for everyone else. So could they benefit? Absolutely. Would I have be, you know, you'd have to give me a lot of resources for me to be in such an environment because of how protective I am of my PF and knowing how resistant people are to a different perspective. So the unapologetic guide had to be unapologetic because I knew I was presenting a different perspective on so many levels some of which have literally snatched the rug out from under people that, you know, I'm, I'm motivated to talk to people like you all, um, I hope, who, who are receptive and curious. You know, maybe you don't agree and that's fine, but you're curious. And I'm not convinced of that this curiosity exists in all institutions. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's definitely something to be considered. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. Cause there, <laughs> there is some pushback. There's, there is some pushback. Yeah. Uh, you had a section in your book where you talked about people being sick and tired. And I thought that was really interesting because I believe that many in the black community are sick and tired. And what's interesting is that you have um, African-American police officers, black police officers who are also like, we saw this coming. We know these guys we work with are racist. And so, you know, we have like a double edge type of thing. Um, but then you have the, the other side who believes that everyone who's a police officer, that there's one shade and that's blue. But for the ones who are aware, who are culturally grounded. So can you tell us about the two brands of sick and tired that you identified in your book? Yeah. And I will say this. Um, I, I basically talk about two different types just to give people some examples, you know, and just to be able to resonate. You know, I think Daisha's like, Daisha already know. Um, so there are two that I identify in the book because I don't think that people necessarily think of them. One is the person who is the religious person who they just push through, you know, they're there for everybody. They're taking care of everybody except themselves. Um, and they're just like, you know, well, but for the grace of God and they just keep it moving, but their PF is probably a six at best. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to call out, especially people who are going through the motions and may not realize it. Um, the other one that I, I describe in the book, cause there could, there's a whole bunch of different types of sick and tires. Um, right. they should probably got another type that's not in the book. Uh, you know, that is the person who they've arrived, you know, mama, I made it. They got their baby bins and they are doing their thing, but their life is pretty inauthentic because they've just been kind of chasing the dreams that somebody else said, I need you to go to law school or go to med school or, you know, or whatever. And I need you to do these things. And that's what you do to be successful. And so without tapping into the authentic self, they just do that. And every day is just about, you know, this hamster wheel that is inauthentic but they're tired of it. They go to work. They don't like those people and they're tired of it, but they just, they just do it. 
Um, they probably even feel disconnected from family. They're the first to go off to college and get a degree. And so, hey, that's that college girl, but right. completely disconnected from the family uh, and disconnected from themselves. And so they're tired in part because in both cases, the inauthenticity, but it's, you know, I mean, it gets, it gets rewarded, you know, or reinforced, you know, the things that we do, we do them because we do get some benefits of them. And what I'm suggesting is those benefits are, there's a ceiling to those benefits. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure, are there, um, I, I can't see the questions, but I know it says like 13 and I know we're going to run a little low on time. So if you want me to do yeah. a rapid fire, I can try and make sure and get some questions answered. But if not, if I've already answered them, then yay, I get an A. Right. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Oh, wow. Okay. So here's a good question. Um, well, all of these questions are really good, by the way, everyone. So um, Jay Ferg says that I have been digging into my own mental health and found a lot of my triggers stem from generational trauma which oftentimes go unaddressed. While on this journey, I often fall into the trap of trying to get my family to follow suit or even address some things, but it becomes exhausting and affects my PF. What advice do you have? Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know what chapter of the book that is, whereby we can't get people to do things they don't want to do. And we can't force conversations for two reasons. One, as you have realized, it's exhausting for you and saps your PF. Two, it undermines the chances that that person will circle back to you when they're ready to have the conversation. So if they see you as someone that's like, you're going to talk to me no matter what, <laughs> you know, then they're not trying to talk to you. It's, it's just not going to happen. And I encourage folks to put themselves in a similar situation that if somebody was trying to get you to do something you didn't want to do, how are you going to react? So right. you make the invitation. You say, you know, this has been troubling me. This is where my pain is. If you were up for it, I'd really like to be able to talk to you about this. Give them a minute. They might say, I don't know what you're talking about. So, okay. You express your pain, your discomfort, and you say, I, but what I'm, t I get that you don't see where I'm coming from, but I'm just telling you I'm, I'm hurt whenever you want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And then walk away. You have no idea until you do it, Jay. You have no idea how wonderful it feels to take control of that situation. I'm going to tell you how I'm feeling and what I, what's going on for me. And then you exit stage left. See what happens. I give it a week. Okay, I made up a week. I don't know. But the point is you can't, you know, badger someone to get them to do something they don't want to do. Right, right. Exactly, exactly. You talked a little bit about this whole notion of calling in Black. And you said that you got it from someone who's internet famous, I think. But I thought it was really interesting, uh, that whole notion. And so Emily asked, when it comes to coming back to work, and supporting black employees, what do leaders need to consider to hold space for the humanity of the experience right now? So someone calls in black and when oh, they no. come, oh. Oh no, let me go back. Okay, oh. so you talked a little bit about the whole notion of calling in black, but what Emily asked is, you know how everyone's basically like working from home at this point. So when it comes, when it comes to coming back, to work, then how should leaders support um, support their black employees? What do leaders need to consider to hold space for them so that they don't necessarily call in black? Because I think that in this space, in terms of having to return to work, having to possibly be one of the few or one of the only um, black people in that space, I can't necessarily see too many black people I know trying to go to work right now in those spaces. Yeah, you know, I think probably one thing not to do, <laughs> I, I can be clear about this. One thing not to do is to put that person to work to help solve the problems 
of what's been going on in that space. And I think I made that YouTube video last week. I don't remember. I lose track of time, like most folks. Um, but the burden that is put on us to help solve now the problem and to solve it at this, in this manic pace, like, ooh, we're going to write a letter and we're going to change everything today. Fascinating. I think folks need to be, you know, more self-read, get, get the book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, read. Mm -hmm. I know Karis, well, I don't know. I'm not going to put y'all on the spot. I can't remember if you have it now or not, but I know it's been sold out. So maybe download the digital version, version but get self-educated. So it's great. You have it. Get self-educated, you know, so that you can try and shift your own thinking rather than putting the burden on that person. Um, so that you could also be authentic because that's the other thing is we know when things have shifted and folks are like, Ooh, we walking on eggshells now. Like it is all exhausting. And depending on where that person is and where they have evolved that employee with where they have evolved in their um, racial identity, you know, they go along or they retreat and supervisors don't have any control over that. You know, the only thing that they have control over is self-educating so that they can create the most inclusive environment possible, period. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's definitely good advice. Definitely good advice. So what would you recommend in terms of boosting PF right now in this moment? Yes, boosting PF. Um, okay, so I I'm, I don't recall if I talked about, um, I did mention things that are in your control and out of your control. We also have internal resources and external resources. I think the single most important internal resource that we have is how we think about everything, really, right? So we might, as an example, say, I can't deal with any of this, um, or I should be able to go to work and help them write their diversity statement. Should is a very bad word. Please just remove it from your vocabulary. You know, we have to be careful about the negative things that we're telling ourselves, the things that take us out of the moment. Um, rather than should, it would be nice if I could help them write that diversity statement, but am I gonna do it? No. Um, you know, so so the internal things that we have control over are out the, are our thoughts. Um, we can also practice deep breathing. Anybody at any moment can do a search for, um, shoot, I just lost that word, diaphragmatic breathing, diaphragmatic, D-I-A-P-H-R-A-G, it's in there, Karis, help me out, diaphragmatic breathing, so do a search for diaphragmatic breathing, don't do a whole lot of research on it, click on the first video and just do what it says, like we don't breathe effectively and that's something that we can do without scheduling an appointment with a therapist, to be in the moment and center ourselves, um, the other thing that we can do, tapping into external resources, we can talk to friends, um, we can create and, and talking to friends about how they're managing their PF. So having an intentional conversation with friends. Uh, if you want to develop a project, sometimes we have to do things to kind of keep our minds busy, unfortunately, without turning on the television or spending a lot of time on social media. So what is a thing? Uh, in your work life, something you wanted to learn, maybe you wanted to clean out a closet, come up with a day-to-day -day stepwise plan for what your goal is and what are all the things you need to do to be able to achieve that goal and work on it for 15 minutes a day. That does two things. One, you get your thing done at some point. And the other thing is that it takes you out of the space of you know negativity and, and racism that's out of your control. We're trying to get things back in our control and to do so how? Intentionally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, so how do you know when you need to see a therapist or did we kind of cover that? No, I don't think we, I don't think we covered that. Um, so I would say that at the point where your PF is hovering at a five or lower, most days, I'll even go as far as say five and a half or six, we'll say five and a half or lower. Most days, most of the day. Um, for people who can say their PF has been hovering real low for like years, you probably need an intervention. Um, but for people who have more like acute low PF, like it's just been the last, not just, but it's been the last few weeks, you know, with coronavirus, um, especially if they're just waiting for coronavirus to end, because I saw a news report, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but coronavirus is going to be here for a while. Um, 
that folks try, you know, some of the strategies that are short term plans, how we're thinking, you know, try those. If it does not work and that PF stays low, it's worth spending time, you know, finding or investing in finding a provider because what ends up happening is that the longer the low PF lasts, the harder it is to reverse it. And that's why I said, if you've been struggling for years, it's probably time to just go ahead and see somebody. Um, but if you feel like there's a, you know, maybe all of your relationships are bad, it might help to talk to somebody. If all the relationships, uh, you feel empty most days, definitely if you had thoughts about, you know, no one would care if you didn't exist or didn't live here. You know, if you can't turn things around with some of the, you know, shorter term strategies and boosting PF short term, then it might be worth talking to someone. Okay. You want to wrap up with one more question? I'm sorry. Yeah, I just have one more question. Just a reminder to everyone that PF is a psychological fortitude that is yes. basically going to carry you over that home. Um, I have a friend whose research is in the concept of the strong black woman. And is the strong black woman persona likely to have high PF? <laughs> okay. So I wrote the book unapologetically because I knew that people would be reading it in the quiet of their own home and they can do their own self-assessment in a way that made sense for them. So those of you who subscribe to Strong Black Women, um, I don't know, either you can look away from the screen or I can look down and off to the side so I don't step on toes. Um, I, For me, I, I question, I don't know, I would have to collect data. I would wonder if someone who identifies as strong black woman, if it is an authentic strong black woman, or if there's kind of cracks mm -hmm. in the armor um, that are unaddressed. I'm okay with stopping there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Was there anything else that you wanted to add to our conversation? Yeah, you know, like I said, just uh, I think the main take home from the book is being much more intentional and especially for people of African descent in the U.S. and wherever folks are, you know, to, to self-assess. And yeah, we are living in ridiculous times right now, but this isn't the first time. And so my hope is that the book gives folks, you know, to amplify awareness you know, I've got, I've seen reviews. One almost had me in tears where she said she got the book for somebody else and it helped her to be more aware of what was going on. Um, because a lot of us are just in a fog going through the motions, but we can take control of some things. And with the goal being that we will in fact live our best lives because we're operating at a PF of eight and higher. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Um, and maybe we can contribute to the movement, you know, of undermining racism in our society. Like, wouldn't that be nice? But not until we're ready. You know, like we can't go tackling racism with a PF of four. It is a disaster waiting to happen. So I think that would be uh, my last points for the for the audience. And thank you all so much for being here. It's been a fun conversation. And thank you. Thank you so very much for being a, a wonderful, a wonderful moderator. Thank you for sharing all of your wisdom with us. And I, like I said, I appreciate seeing you again and glad everything's going well and your book is selling out and all that great stuff. <laughs> it is. I don't know if ER is going to come. Yeah, okay, I'm going to pop back okay, up. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, I just want to say thank you to you both. This was a really lovely um, and thoughtful conversation and wonderful questions from the audience. I'm going to... Um, Remind folks one more time, we have copies in our store ready to send out, but because of some janky supply chain problems, uh, we need you to email info at karisbooksandmore.com or give us a call at 404-524-0304. I've put it in the chat. We would love for you to please order your book. Um, we're sorry for the extra step, but we really want to get these books into your hands. I'm sure after hearing this conversation, you're going to want to buy it for yourself and also maybe for some family members. Um, put it on the coffee table, you know, just leave, leave it out um, so many people can engage with it. Um, we are really excited to have this resource for our community. Actually, would you hold it up so folks can see what it looks like, Dr. Walker? Oh, see, I have. There we uh, go. There thank we go. you. There we go. <laughs> thank That's you, Dr. Lovick. Like. <laughs> no problem. I don't know yeah. if you saw mine. I've got little sticky notes. I, I saw your sticky notes. <laughs> 
Yes. And it's, yeah. a, it's a great price point. It's very, it's a, it's very affordable, which often psychology books are not. So that was a really good thing uh, for the publisher to do. So we're very, very excited about that. Um, the last thing it's my job to do is to encourage you. I know folks are all over the place with their money right now, but if you are able to give any kind of donation, um, we are primarily individually donor funded. That's how we do this work. That's how we pay for these digital platforms. Um, so we appreciate it. There's no amount too small. A dollar helps us. Um, every little bit helps. So if you're able to click on that um, and, and throw a dollar into the ring, we really appreciate it. Um, and other than that, we would love for you to follow Karis uh, on this platform. But also, if you want to get on our email list, um, just go to our website and check that out. Follow us on Facebook. We're on Facebook, Twitter, um, and on uh, Instagram. So all the social media stuff, Karis Books and more. Um, we would love for you to be part of our community if you are not already. So thank y'all. Um, this was really wonderful. And uh, I'll leave the chat open for another minute or two so folks can continue to say hi to one another and uh, and go from there. So yes, Dr. Rita Walker on IG. Actually, one last thing I wanted to do, which is put y'all's websites in the chat. So let me do that real quick okay. because we have Dr. Rita Walker's website right here. So make sure you get that right here. And we have Haduma Services, which is a really important thing that all of our children are gonna need right now as we figure out what's gonna happen after after COVID, how, how folks are gonna go forward to post-secondary education. So check those two things out. Any, any closing stuff that y'all wanna say before we head out? No, I mean, I'm just excited that everyone hung in there with us for the time. So I'm going to let folks go get there. Well, I guess it's kind of late on the East Coast. Um, but yeah, I just thank you again for the invitation. And thank you you know, so much, Dr. Levitt. It's been a wonderful, wonderful time. Always good yeah, seeing you. Definitely. Yeah, same here. Same yes. here. But it's never too late for me to eat. So I'm about to do that. <laughs> go get your evening snack. Um, oh, oh, there's a question. You. Somebody asked. Oh, yes, okay. this, this will immediately become live. So you can send it to someone right away, but um, I will then be adding captions to it for um, deaf and hard of hearing folks and then putting it on YouTube, um, hopefully within a week. So you can go check out, Care. it's the YouTube channel is Kara Circle on YouTube. So go check that out. You can also see all of our older programs, but if anybody, if you wanna watch it right away or send it to anyone right away, it's gonna be available just at this link um, that you use to sign in but um, it will soon be on YouTube as well. So um, please share it with lots of people, share the information about the book. We really are excited about this resource. Um, so we want to get the word out. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate right. it. Yeah. Thank you both. Have a great night and everybody be safe out there. Take care. All right.